Hello again, I'm Patrick Murray, and this is my summary and reflection on Chapter 3 of The Sources of Christian Ethics by the French Dominican Cervais Pincaris. In the introduction, Chapter 1 and Chapter 2, um, Pincaris covered what moral ethics really is, so he kind of defined it for us in, um, and contrasted it to, to other definitions operative in the last few centuries. Um, and then he identified you know, what areas of human life sort of are affected by the study. And uh, now, in Chapter 3, we're going to cover the human aspect of Christian ethics, as he calls it. And um, he's going to do that by comparing, really contrasting, Christian ethics, the study, with other related studies. So there's two big chunks in Chapter 3, which, by the way, Chapter 3 is a long chapter, the, uh, almost the longest in the book, so bear with me. Two main chunks. Christian, how does Christian ethics differ from behavioral sciences? And how does Christian ethics differ from uh, uh, what he calls arts and technique, art and technique? So those two chunks, he's also going to seek how, those, how collaboration can be sought between Christian ethics and those two studies so as to form a well-rounded uh, uh, moral theology um, and so as to not um, sort of dispense with legitimate knowledge that can be gained from those studies. So let's go ahead and jump jump in here. Um, the, the, in the first section, he, as a way of introduction, he kind of touches on a point made in a previous chapter. He says, Christian, ethic deal, Christian ethics deals with all human acts insofar as they are voluntary. He says, a system based on obligation, remember um, how much uh, he wants to get away from that obligation-centered system. Um, a system based on obligation ignores free acts, he says, and these are the most interior of human acts, things like vocation, seeking perfection, etc. So um, he wants to get away from that obligation-centered system of moral theology because obligation sort of ignores those things which are most interior to human persons, which are f those free acts. Um, and this is where the real meat of our moral life exists. Um, away from, sort of opposite from the question of obligation. He says, the freer an act is in its thrust towards perfection, the richer its human quality, since this is the ultimate purpose of law and its crowning glory. So he wants to be clear that we're talking about the most free acts that a person has. Right? So um, as he um, goes into the next section where he contrasts moral theology and the behavioral sciences, he talks first about knowledge, and he identifies four types of knowledge in the moral context. Um, I'm going to name them quickly. Fontal knowledge is number one. Reflex or instinctive knowledge is number two. Um, reflective knowledge is number three. And theoretic or systematic knowledge is number four. Fontal knowledge is the... He defines fontal knowledge as direct, intuitive, dynamic, creative, inexhaustible as a wellspring. This is the type of, this is the level of interiority where the Holy Spirit acts within us. This is where intentions, which are the root of our actions, are formed. Um, and this, this type of knowledge anticipates ideas and words and is part of our spiritual nature, he says. Hard to understand, <coughs> hard to understand but I think it's helpful to identify the other types of knowledge to better understand fontal knowledge. So secondly, we have reflex or instinctive knowledge. Um, he says, in the act of observing ourselves, another kind of knowledge emerges, which we call reflex or instinctive, a reflection of action in our consciousness. When we act or speak, even when we think, we are looking at ourselves as if in an interior mirror. So this is that level of knowledge, which is immediately, which is the first level of real conscious thought. So um, anytime you do or think anything, there's a, there's a certain type of thought, which is reflex, which is instinctive. Um, he says this gives rise, this can give rise to vanity and pride and timidity, um, etc. But it's also essential for us to be able to control our actions, feelings, and thoughts. So this is that first level where we're um, immediately conscious of what we're doing or what we're thinking. And this is where um, the first level of, of moral substance uh, comes into our actions and thoughts, where we can give in to pride or uh, 
um, a lack of self-esteem or confidence or where we can control our thoughts and actions. Right? Thirdly, reflective knowledge is when reflex knowledge um, is when we try to engage in an actual act of reflection. So when we try to answer questions of why or how in terms of our own action and intention, um, we engage in reflective knowledge. So this is um, um, this tries to grasp motives for actions in order to explain, justify, critique, or improve. Um, this is also the type of knowledge that is expressed in instructive or wisdom literature, like proverbs, in, in laws. Um, it's also the, the stuff of the wisdom literature in the Bible. Um, also, spiritual and mystical works would fall under this category of self-reflection, right? Finally, there's theoretic or syst uh, systematic knowledge. So this is the type of knowledge that attempts to gather together the strands of moral knowledge and organize them into a universal system on a scientific plane. So this is where systematic theology or uh, systems of moral theology exist on this fourth plane. Um, he says all four of these types of knowledge are dynamically continuous with each other, and it's ultimately through action, especially upright action, that the authenticity the authenticity of a moral system is put to the test and can grow by experience. There's a kind of flow. Fontal knowledge, font-like knowledge, is where all knowledge flows from. It tends to develop into sapiential knowledge, like wisdom knowledge, uh, what you ought not to do, self-reflection. And then that, that um, develops into scientific forms, which are like systematized, uh, um, abstract, uh, systems of, of, of moral thought and action. So again, frontal knowledge is that mystical, sort of hard to pin down um, type of knowledge that's sort of spontaneous, that uh, is intuitive and dynamic. It leads to um, reflection, which then it develops into um, a systematic form of thought. He's going to return to this theme of experience, though. Experience is really important. He says experience is um, necessary for the formation of a systematic form of, the, of morality, and it's the end also of a systematic form of, of morality and theology. So experience, personal experience, is uh, very important for Pink Ears. In contrast to those four types of moral knowledge, he's going, he talks about positivist knowledge. This is knowledge that proceeds by way of rigorous observation of facts perceptible to the senses um, and to instruments that in turn perfect the senses, or phenomena, right? So this is just the scientific method. Uh, there's a lot of value in this method, as we know, but we have to recognize its limitations, as pure objectivity is impossible. We must resist this rising to the level of a philosophy, he says on page 58. So... Um, Science obviously is valuable, and he's going to keep saying this, but especially in terms of in the context of the behavioral sciences, when um, the scientific method seeks to answer all questions that are even outside of its own scope, out of, outside of its limitations, when it tries to rise to the level of a philosophy, he says, this is when things get dangerous, and he calls this positivism, right? Um, so we've talked about the types of knowledge inherent in, in the different systems. A positivist and moral uh, theology. So now he's going to talk about methodology, the different methods that these two systems use. So um, he kind of has there's five main points here. And what I like about this section is he makes good on the promise he made in the introduction um, of, of using scripture to really support to be the foundation of the of his of his study. Um, for each of these sections, he's going to use scri a scriptural basis to, to make his point. So first he says, the reflective moral method studies actions from within, while the positive science, positivist sciences study it from without. Um, moral knowledge examines actions from an interior perspective. Um, Moral knowledge is the efficient and final cause of action. This is kind of confusing, but he uh, talks about, he uses Thomistic language here to, uh, to identify efficient causality and final causality 
in moral actions. And he uses two quotes from the Sermon on the Mount to, to do this. Um, anyone who is angry with his brother will answer for, will answer for it but, uh, before the court. That's Matthew 5.22. Um, this shows efficient, efficient causality in morality. This is formed by the person's responsibility. Right? Um, secondly, how happy are the poor in spirit? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is Matthew 5, 3. He identifies this as an example of final causality in Scripture, which is the um, person's mastery in the choice of means and end. So it's important for Pink Harris to use this Thomistic language. He is a Thomist, after all. And um, it also um, it, it unifies the scriptural understanding of morality and a Thomistic understanding. I think it's 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 genius. Um, in the first case, uh, moral the, moral knowledge is the efficient cause. Um, by sorry, excuse me. In the in the first case, moral knowledge is the efficient cause because by it, a person is responsible for his actions, right? Even interior ones, and is therefore subject to judgment. In the second case, moral knowledge is the final cause because by it a person obtains beatitude. In positivist knowledge, um, positive, positivist knowledge considers external ex, uh, appearances of actions in contrast to moral, moral knowledge there. So he says the fundamental, the fundamental characteristic of positivist philosophy is to consider all phenomena as subject to invariable na natural laws. The end of all our efforts is to discover these and reduce them to the smallest possible number. The search for so-called first or final causes strikes us as absolutely impossible and meaningless. Um, so that's a quote from a, uh, from a positivist scientist. I can't remember who, but um, that, that quote that he draws, um, he identifies this phrase, the end of all of our efforts is to discover these, uh, etc. The, the very fact of that phrase, the end of all of our efforts, that, that is a final, that is a statement of final causality, which he then goes on to criticize. He says, the, the, the search for so-called final cause, causes strikes us as absolutely impossible and meaningless. So um, it's impossible to remove final causality from, from a study, whether it be a uh, moral or a positivist study. And to seek to do so is to seek to make science, a, philo a philosophy, something that's not, uh, it doesn't have the rigor and, sc and scope to do. But he says, as a kind of a disclaimer, still it is true that positivist science, by its very method, gives priority to material causality since its starting point is the succession and simultaneity of phenomena. So it has its legitimate function. Um, um, but the, and this is going to lead, but it's it, it it gives its starting point is the succession and simultaneity of phenomena. So it can only look backwards, and that's going to lead us into um, one of our next points here. Secondly, so firstly, just to reiterate, moral knowledge examines actions from an interior perspective. Positivist knowledge examines them from an exterior perspective. Two. Moral knowledge is dynamic, directive, and normative, while positivist knowledge is neutral, non-directive, and non-normative. Um, the scriptural basis here, moral knowledge accompanies the entire course of an action, keeping the end always in mind, looking to the future. It usually commands immediate things to be done as well, but rises above the level of mere obligation when it accords with wisdom. So this is a, exemplified in the precepts of the Sermon on the Mount. He says these are actually the commands found in the Decalogue, but permeated and empowered by the commandments of love of God and neighbor. So it's forward-looking, it's dynamic, it's directive, it's always keeping the end in mind, and it's normative, it's telling us how we ought to do things, right? So the person who acquires moral knowledge cannot remain indifferent, since it directly concerns the quality of the one who acts. Moral knowledge con concerns directly my actions. So I have to be invested. I have to be committed. Right? Positive no positivist knowledge, by contrast, is static and observational. It ignores the question of responsibility in acts. Right? It considers phenomena as a succession of facts, doesn't use data to inform subsequent action. 
The knowledge is not directive or formative. It only makes a statement about the present simultaneous right, or the past succession. Um, so it's sort of present and backward looking. It can't look to intention and, 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 and the future. Positivist, positivist knowledge stresses analysis above all else, since its main object is to break down phenomena into their simplest elements, so as to discover the laws determining them. Right? Number three. So again, in review number two, um, moral knowledge is dynamic, directive, and normative. Positivist knowledge is neutral, non-directive, and non-normative. Thirdly, moral knowledge is personal. Positivist knowledge, apersonal. Um, since moral knowledge makes the person responsible, moral knowledge is inextricably is inextricable from personality. It also requires a personal commitment from the moral person. Right? Um, positivist knowledge is apersonal because of its method. Uh, it's, it is empirical and therefore for apersonal. It seeks to be apersonal. It seeks to be objective. Right? Positivism reduces emotions, moral decisions, etc., to material data, physiological, biological, or psychic components, he says. It has its place, of course, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't and can't out overstep its bounds. Fourthly, um, objectivity is the, is the subject matter here. So positivism claims objectivity, which it seeks. The scientific observer has to be detached has to detach himself from um, his his object so as to ensure an unprejudiced look at the facts. So he wants to be as objective and as little subjective as possible. Of course, it's impossible, as we know, to be purely objective, but the scientist seeks to be as objective as possible. Um, in reality, scientific objectivity can be achieved only partially, he says. Despite all efforts, the scientist can never... Um, prescind totally from his subjectivity, which includes, for example, the desire to know, to master his material, to surpass his rivals, etc. All of these subjective realities are present in the study. Moral objectivity, so, he, so one might be inclined to think that there is no objectivity in moral uh, matters, but he says that there is. Moral knowledge has an objectivity by virtue of the fact that in pursuing goodness and truth, the actor is pushed beyond himself into interaction with other moral agents. He says communion and collaboration. So there's a kind of, he calls it trans-subjective objectivity, which is objective because it forces an individual to go beyond himself in seeking goodness and truth. This objectivity is characterized by a personal objectivity, which seems paradoxical, but is real and demonstrable. Um, fifthly, experience in positivist and moral knowledge. So we just dealt with objectivity. Now we're going to deal with experience, which is relevant in both fields. Experiments basic to the... Um, so he's, he, there's a subsection here. Experiments basic to the sciences. There are limits inherent to the method itself in experiments since it is centered on external objectivity. Scientific observation cannot reveal to us the nature of living things. In contrast, moral or interior experience is as real as any positivist science and is itself understandable as a science, but it can only be analyzed interiorly. So its method of analysis will look very different from that of the positivist science sciences. The objection is that since personal experience is subjective, um, it is only able to be studied by an individual, so it's not accessible to general knowledge. It cannot rise to the level of a true science. However, the more authentically personal an experience is, the greater its resonance in the human audience. So he cites, like, for example, the Confessions of St. Augustine, these uh, very interior and personal accounts and experiences are those which resonate with the human spirit most, right? Which, which is a counterexample to the, you know, so-called um, non-objectivity of, of moral things. Uh, so that, 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 again, experience, right? Having heard or read and resonated with these, with these accounts and these uh, moral stories, uh, a person can identify that, that it's, it's just true that there is objectivity in moral. There is um, legitimate objective experience in moral 
in moral scenarios. So now he seeks collaboration between the two, between science and morality. Basically, he says, moral theory considers human acts from the viewpoint of the person's dynamic interiority by means of reflection. The point of departure for, departure for positive science is external, in keeping with the proper, proper method. So, as he goes into the section on collaboration between science and morality, he's going to um, sort of summarize what, he, what he's covered so far. Um, he says, moral theory considers human acts from the viewpoint of the person's dynamic interiority by means of reflection, knowledge again, right? The point of departure for positivist sciences is external in keeping with its, prop with its proper method. So think about uh, some of the modern theories of like conditioning. You have, um, well, you know, why, why does the human person experience morality? There are scientific theories which attribute that to instinct, um, evolution, uh, uh, you know, the greater good of the species, this type of sort of Darwinian moral theory. Uh, so this is very common, and which is, and this is a way of trying to understand morality through the lens of, uh, of a positivist like behavioral science exclusively. And it doesn't work, right? The problem with strict positivism is that it must assume nature and teleology, which he's going to go into. Um, however, there is collaboration. There's, collaboration is possible, and it's actually n not only possible, it's necessary. He says these understandings can collaborate because they need to in order to form a well-rounded moral person. Moral knowledge deals with all things interior to man, things which positivist science, sciences don't have access to. The positivist sciences, on the other hand, promote a better understanding of the many social, psychological, historical, and cultural factors involved in any concrete action. Right. So those things are relevant, Social, psychological, historical, and cultural factors are relevant, and that's what the behavioral sciences help us to bring into the cons bring into consideration. He cites an example at the end here. Um, the The example is uh, reconciling the historical critical method with the plain meaning of scripture. Um, the po uh, positive ex exegesis of scripture, such as like historic history. Um, uh, archaeology, um, authorship, authorial intent, all of these things. Um, this, th these are legitimate types of truth, truths that can help us understand the meaning of Scripture. But they should never overshadow the plain moral meaning of the text itself, which would be the traditional moral understanding. right? So a, a balance between these things can help us to have a greater understanding of Scripture um, while an ex exclusive you know, lean to one side or the other will have a, a less rich understanding or a completely, you know, uh, completely wrong understanding of, of what scripture means. The next section is, um, are the dangers of, um, did he, the, it's entitled Three Dangers to be Encountered um, in the Relation Between Moral Theology and the Behavioral Sciences. So, uh, danger number one, the abdication of ethicists. Ethicists will, will, by the dramatic success of the behavioral sciences, lose faith in moral knowledge and wind up with shifting morality. Right? Ethicists need to be aware that moral knowledge uh, has its own trans-subjective objectivity, like I said, which allows it to persist through all times and social environments. So this would be the danger that ethicists uh, would um, attribute morality to merely social construct or cultural construct. Right? This is a danger that has to be that we have to be wary of. Number two, the high-handedness of the scientist. This is the tendency of all sciences that seeks to explain the universe, including the inter interiority of man, by its own method, which is impossible. Science is not itself is not to blame the method, but the pride of scientists, which make the science into a philosophy, like we've talked about before. He says there is no substitute for lived experience in understanding the human person. Number three. Creating a one-dimensional world interiority. This is a worldview in which the sense experience, in which sense experience is the only legitimate form of knowledge, and empirical data is the only reliable source thereof. In this system, there is no room for morality. This is where explanations of moral systems resort to instinct, history, evolution, etc. So, when the whole experience of the world is relegated to mere mere sense experience, um, this is very dangerous, right? 
Um, as a last uh, reflection before, um, before moving on to the distinction between morality and art and technique, he talks about interiority and exteriority. Um, moral interiority is the deepest form of interiority. This is a spiritual faculty by which a person can freely express his form and existence in action. This is the secret place described in scripture wherein the Holy Spirit acts in us. Interior and exterior should be in collaboration. So, for example, like Mother Teresa never sacrificed prayer time if for, for service. Right? She always made sure to go to Mass to have that holy hour in the morning. Um, interiority has a depth. Interior life requires looking beneath the surface of impressions, reactions, emotions, etc. to see what is active below. It also has a height. We are required to transcend that which is morally base, uh, laziness, and apathy, for example, so as to ascend to the heights of goodness. It has a solidity. Storing up experience and reflection is necessary for reverence and fidelity. There's a sort of uh, solidness to it. And it has a great breadth. When all of these expand, depth, height, solidity, human interiority takes on greater breadth and is able to assimilate more emotion, reflection, etc. It is able to better harmonize truths and better understand history of thought. It's more robust and, and, and it, it understands the world better, right? So the interiority of, 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 of morality, a moral interiority of a person, it has to ascend to the heights, descend to the depths, so to speak. It has to grow in solidity and thereby expand in breadth, so to better understand the world. In contrast, there is the life of exteriority. So exteriority is when appearance is substituted for reality. Um, it's where superficiality um, and fleeting thoughts of popular opinion um, and curiosity take the place of serious reflection. Um, in exteriority, there is triteness, right? People take the path of least resistance. Um, people follow their whims and chatter there's, uh, there's an aspect of dissipation. And finally, narrowness. Um, this restricts the mind and heart. A tolerance for the general opinion is mistaken for broad-mindedness, which I think you see blatantly clearly in, in the culture today. Um, this is an ultimate indifference to truth. So he kind of c contrasts these two things. In his defense of interiority, he names these these points, this depth, height, solidity, breadth. Um, and he contrasts these to the superficiality, traitness, dissipation, and the narrowness of a life of exteriority. Interiority is absolutely essential. Um, it's absolute, is an absolute essential dimension of morality. He quotes Ephesians here at the end of this section. Out of his infinite glory, may the Father give you the power through his Spirit for your hidden self to grow strong so that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. And then, planted in love and built on love, you will, with all the saints, have strength to grasp the breadth and length, the height and the depth, until, knowing the love of Christ, which is beyond all knowledge, you are filled with the utter fullness of God. Beautiful. That's Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. Okay, the distinction between morality and art and technique. So first he uh, just defines these terms very basically, right? By art and technique, he means something very similar. That is, um, I think what we would in the modern world use the word technique primarily to, to identify. So he, he talks about the, the art as, as, you know, the art of, I think he says culinary, the culinary arts, or the veterinary arts, or the military arts. It's just a, a method by which to do something, right? So there's a, a, a short um, section on defining the terms. And then he goes on to uh, the differences between ethics and art and technique. So art and technique are independent of personal dispositions and intentions. Um, and But personal dispositions and intentions are the direct object of morality, right? So there's a difference. He says, in art and technique, it is preferable to make mistakes knowingly. In morality, it is prefer it's pref 
preferable to not make mistakes knowingly. To, to do something wrong by accident is far better than to do it on purpose, right? Whereas if you were to make a mistake, you know, I'm a musician, so if I were to make a mistake, it would be preferable that I knew that I made a mistake, right? Morality concerns not only the right way of acting, but also the right thing to do. So, whereas art and technique um, concern only the right way of acting. Morality is the concern of every person, while art and technique are the concern of some people sometimes, namely the artist or the technician. Um, and uh, technique can transform mediums of access, but not content of moral or spiritual or cultural things. Right, so uh, technique doesn't, doesn't um, uh, contain within itself the breadth that morality does, namely uh, the moral, spiritual, and cultural truths. Um, he finishes here with definitions um, derived from, from classical definitions. He says that ethics is the right reason or the science of human action. And he says that art or technique is the right reason or the science of work or the science of making. Human action, so ethics has to do with human action, the science thereof, and art or technique has to do with work or the science of making. Um, finally, he says there are two types of action. There's imminent action. This is action that takes place within the agent, uh, such as knowledge, love, intention, etc. And then there's transitive action, which transforms material outside the agent, such as production. Okay. Um, so ethics concerns imminent action, and art or technique concerns transitive action. There are some concerns here with, um, just like there were concerns with the behavioral sciences, there are concerns with art and technique. Um, there's high-handedness among technicians, just like there was high-handedness among the scientists, and it's a very similar problem. Like science, it seeks to use its own method to answer the questions of the world. Um, St. John Paul II says that technical progress always seems to outpace the associated ethics, right? So. Um, we come up with ways of doing things, technical processes, like think of in vitro fertilization before it, that outpaces the ethics around that study. So we find a way to do something and we immediately start doing it without considering the ethics, right? John Paul II asks, does this progress which has man for its author and promoter make human life on earth more human in every aspect of that life? Does it make it more worthy of man? This is some criteria, some questions he asks when thinking about technique and art. Um, there's a, a temptation to absolutize technical progress, which views human beings only in their utility, right? Uh, again, as a disclaimer, he says, don't reject technology, uh, but it must remain a means while the soul remains the goal, right? Um, the final section of this chapter we're closing in on the end here, is entitled In Search of the Human Dimension, which is returning to the, the, the uh, title of the entire chapter, right? Human, the human aspect of Christian ethics. So In Search of the Human Dimension. Ethics is the most human of all the sciences because its concern is with the human person as a free, competent, and responsible agent. It's the most human of all the sciences, ethics is. Um, reality doesn't exist within the limits of concepts and theories, he says, especially the reality of human beings. No anthropology can plumb the depths of, human of humanity, right? So he says that the depths of humanity is, concerns actions and thoughts, and no anthropology and no science can, can, can get to that depth, action and thought, right? Moral precepts should not be absolutized as an end, also. They are a pathway that lead to the individual human being. So on the face, this sounds sort of uh, relativistic, I think. Moral precepts should not be absolutized as an end. But what he's saying is, um, the moral precept, the rule, the law, is not the end in itself. That is supposed to lead you 
to the, the purpose of the human being, right? The human being is the end. Um, Jesus shows the innate dignity each human life has. Moral precepts are meant to lead the ethicist to the dignity of a person, right? So when Jesus gives moral prescriptions, he always has the dignity of the person in mind. Um, there's also the human as it opens onto the divine. This is the next section. Um, he says, since the Renaissance, it has been assumed that man and God are in competition with each other. This is a theme that Bishop Barron takes up, I think. Um, um, Above and beyond the corruption caused by sin, there is a certain harmony between the human and the divine, which is the very work of God, the image of God in us, restored by grace. So here is some important Thomistic thought, right? Scholastic thought, that humanity and God are not in competition with each other. In fact, the, 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 um, the trajectory of human life is towards the, the divine, right? Um, the more... Hum humanity is in line with the precept with the precepts of the divine. Um, the more human he becomes, right? these things are complementary, not in competition. And then at the end of that quote, he says, "Which is the very work of God, the image of God in us, restored by grace, restored by grace. Um, grace builds and on and perfects nature, right? So he he returns to that that solid." Uh, uh, Thomistic theme principle that grace builds on and perfects nature it doesn't destroy it humans he says aren't fully human um, without the grace of God so grace perfects nature right a very important principle for, for Thomas and also for Pinkers and finally he returns to the theme of experience he says experience is necessary um, because action experience is the very matter of morality. But the kind of experience also matters, right? Experience is absolutely necessary for the study of moral theology. The kind of experience matters. So he talks um, about virtue. Virtue has been degraded and looked down upon as prudish uh, in recent times. And that's undo undoubtedly true. But a life of virtue is the most interesting type of life, right? So he has some soaring words for virtues like meekness, courage, chastity, and faith. He asks, who understands the world better? The courageous person who is willing to confront reality or the cowardly person who, is, who is, uh, shies away from an engagement with reality? The meek person who, who has a self-knowledge and a self-control um, or the arrogant person who doesn't look and understand his own soul, right? The chaste person who is able to look um, at, at, at the interiority of another person, to penetrate into beyond the exterior of a person, right? Does he understand a person um, or the world more, or does the sinner, the lustful person, who can only see the exterior, right? Um, so he makes the argument that the virtuous person sees and understands sin and the world far better than the sinner can. And I think this is true. Finally, as a last note, he talks about the use of experience. Experience, just raw experience by itself, doesn't really do much for the person. But the a correct use of it is, is essential for forming a person morally. He says, reflection and keenness of mind is needed to make sense of experience. Um, this forms wisdom. Um, reflection on experience is, is where wisdom comes from. And this is like the womb. I love this quote. It's like the womb in which moral science is formed and to which it, c it should continually return. So remember, wisdom is that third type of moral knowledge, that reflective knowledge, where we, whereupon we reflect on our actions and intentions um, so as to understand our interiority. And this, that wisdom is, he describes it as, it's like the womb in which moral science, science being that fourth type of knowledge, it's where that is formed, and to which it should constantly, continually return. So, um, so much in this chapter. Um, I hope this is helpful. This is, uh, I think, going to be our longest, um, our longest video in this s series.
So uh, again, I hope this was helpful, and I'll see you again for Chapter 4.